here we are uh, training, training, training uh, our regimental colonel uh, <clears throat> after we've made the uh, jump from that engine nacelle, we've, we uh, coasted down a long uh, cable and uh, landed in a, a sawdust pit. The 12 was gathered together there and, <clears throat> and uh, then we went to see the colonel. And uh, of course he had one question, what are we here for? And you're supposed to say to kill Germans. Well, we, didn't, we were dumb and we didn't know that, so we gave all kinds of crazy answers. <clears throat> so if he was satisfied that we were an athlete and uh, we could be a good soldier uh, <clears throat> and uh, <clears throat> we had a little education, <clears throat> then okay, we go over to the psychiatrist. Uh, he asked oh. us all kinds of dumb questions. <laughs> you know. And then from there, another physical exam. Now, are you in the States at this time? Or yeah, are you no, we were in the United States. We're okay. still in Georgia. Okay, this is all Georgia. We spent 13 weeks in uh, Camp Tacoa, Georgia, and then we uh, went to Fort Benning, Georgia for jump training. It was uh, four weeks there. <clears throat> and uh, well, now we were, we were in such a superb physical condition that uh, uh, section uh, a, B, C, and D were the phases that we went through in, in Fort Benning. Phase A was physical education, and uh, we were all out there exercising, and <clears throat> the uh, uh, instructors, they were bronzed Apollos. I mean, they were muscle men. They wore t-shirts about eight sizes too small, so the muscles, <laughs> the muscles bulged all over. <laughs> so I mean, we were we we were we were kind and of. This was long before all the testosterone. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we were kind of smart, Alex, in this too, because we teased the uh, 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 drill instructors, and they got so angry with us they made uh, the hair stand on the back of our head at attention when they got to us. So if we did something wrong on purpose or because they didn't like it, uh, they'd come over. You got 25 push-ups. We dumbfounded, we'd say, which arm sergeant? They'd Ooh. have a fit. <laughs> and after we finished the 25 with one arm, uh, we went 25 more on the other arm. So they left us alone they after asked that. For it, didn't oh, they? yeah, they asked for it. <laughs> so, Tom, you went through all your training in the States, and then you were sent overseas. Hmm. You weren't really expecting to get sent overseas, you said earlier, quite that quickly. But when you did, where did you land when you got sent? <coughs> well, we, from Camp Tacoa, we went to uh, Camp Mackle, and we did the Tennessee maneuvers. And that was a full week of activities. Uh, from there, we uh, moved to uh, Boston at Camp uh, Miles Standish, American history. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Camp Miles Standish. and. Uh, <coughs> Uh, we were oriented there. A colonel got in front of us on the stage and told us uh, how to use uh, anti-gas ointment. And you take off your shoe and you put it on your bare feet. That is a lot of baloney. A, uh, a major general came up, I believe that's what his rank was, and, and uh, uh, absconded him for giving such information out and corrected. You put anti-gas ointment on your shoes, not on your bare skin. Yeah. So it doesn't sound like it would feel too good on your back. No, feet. no, greasy, heavy stuff. Uh, from uh, so boards. So when, when you went overseas, did you bring a good luck charm with you? <coughs> good luck charm or not, it was a tasty bit. It was a one-pound bar of maple sugar given to me by the mother of my girlfriend who was in Washington, D.C. And uh, I was sent on a number of, uh, of uh, uh, activities. I was a uh, non-commissioned officer for poison gases, studied uh, clarisetophenone uh, mustard gas. I got two marks on my, my uh, 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 forearms, mustard gas ointment was put on there and then uh, uh, some anecdote for it and, and uh, uh, phosgene. So I knew mustard gas, so I, I had to deal with that thing. Uh, I, was, uh, I was sent to uh, 
uh, with my buddy Guy Sessions, who came out of State College at the same time I did, but he landed up in Tacoma uh, the week ahead of me. We didn't make any contact with him. He had volunteered for the 501 too. So he was in the first platoon, I was in the third platoon. But <clears throat> uh, after our uh, activities there at Camp Mackle, uh, we went to uh, Miles Standish, and then from there on you know, the William G. Gothels. William G. Gothels was the, was the doctor that uh, uh, identified mosquito uh, uh, difficulties in Panama Canal digging. So they named the ship after him. So it was an old uh, World War I steel reinforced concrete Liberty ship. And this is what's taking you over to England? Yeah. So we waited and waited, and then we, we finally ended up in a convoy. It took 10 days to get over there. And uh, the, the camp was so filthy, so dirty. 10,000 guys, I think, they were pumping out of Camp Mac or Camp uh, uh, Miles Standish that I got the mumps on oh. both sides. And that's painful business. So they isolated me in a ward, and I had white I had pillows and, and uh, 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 white sheets and whatnot. And I can hear the guys doing exercises on board deck. And uh, the colonel wanted the, uh, some practice done by the anti-aircraft, his anti-aircraft uh, organization. So he sent up a balloon, and uh, he told them when to fire. And they uh, uh, fired and fired when they on command, and they kept missing. So he took over and he fired and he shot the balloon down. So <laughs> <laughs> he, he was quite a character. He, uh, Colonel Johnson was uh, a graduate of Naval Academy, didn't like that too well. So we, we volunteered for uh, airborne activities in the Army. <clears throat> and so we landed in Glasgow, Scotland. <clears throat> And uh, I took 10 guys to the hospital in Glasgow for 10 days till we uh, got uh, released. And then uh, we maneuvered down to Lambourne, where the regiment was associated. And we lived in a, uh, uh, a monastery, uh, uh, a church area where there were old graves that, oh, they're so almost unidentifiable tombstones. And we all always were <coughs> a kind of creative characters that we discovered a lot of catacombs and we were maneuvering down the catacombs until the clergy found out about it and, and they didn't like that so it stopped us from doing that so they sealed up the catacombs. <laughs> but we, uh, we, we maneuvered again and again at a higher level of, uh, of techniques and, and using our weapons and firing and, and uh, chasing uh, each other across uh, cemeteries and, and uh, jumping over tombstones and through wheat fields, breaking down their, their barbed wire fences <coughs> and uh, fighting the, uh, the uh, black troops that in Bristol, where they finally decided that the uh, blacks could have uh, uh, two days in uh, Bristol and then the whites could have another two days, but not everybody at the same time because there was a constant continuous fighting going on. They, they mistreated the black people, something terrible. <coughs> And so we had uh, uh, three practice maneuvers in uh, uh, England that uh, were to be uh, rep uh, replicas or repeats of the landing that the uh, sea forces were uh, supposed to uh, uh, make. Operation Eagle, Operation Beaver, and Operation Tiger. And then finally, Operation Overlord. So. <clears throat> How close are we to D-Day at this point? That's, I'm trying to get my time reference. This was, uh, we landed in uh, Glasgow, Scotland, January 1, 1944. Okay. And from there, I was in isolation for a bit. And then, uh, like I told you, finally, we, we made it down to uh, uh, Camp Lamborn and uh, uh, we got going on some of our activities. So again, I was... Uh, so now are we in about March? Of 44, we, yeah, April? we're into February, March of, of 44, and we still didn't know where we were going. So you still didn't have a sense of what no, was coming? No, 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 uh, especially me because I was assigned uh, uh, in each one of these uh, uh, exercises to a, a Lieutenant Colonel uh, Carroll. He was the uh, assistant executive officer of the regiment. 
And I had to know what he's doing, what he was doing, and where he was, and be able to communicate with him right away. So I occupied his tent, and, and uh, during the, uh, the uh, second, third, fourth, and fifth of, uh, of June. So I was away from the company. I knew what oh, the company wow. was doing. Oh, wow. the, the majority of the company was going through Nissen huts, of which there was a diorama display of the activities where we're going to land. Uh, uh, from an altitude of about 3,000 feet. It was built to that perspective. So I didn't get to ever get to see those things. So tell, oops, tell us about your mindset and let's go into D-Day now. Let's go into <coughs> the actual jumping and your mindset and how you are thinking. Well, I... Uh, <coughs> Did you realize at that moment? No. You still didn't? No, still didn't know exactly where we were going to go because I was put on special detail for the colonel and I was not with the company. Right. And then on uh, the... But did the gentleman in the company know what was going on? Did they kind of clue you in? Or? No, it was a last minute thing that I came back to the company. Okay. And so <clears throat> uh, there was not much talk about it. They were focused on other things, writing letters and, and uh, little mementos that they uh, traded among and between, uh, secret uh, codes that they had one with the other. And, and uh, we had uh, uh, five sets of clothes we were wearing, uh, GI underwear, they had to be olive drab, and, and uh, then uh, uh, a Class A uniform, woolen, and, and then uh, a combat uniform, the upper part of it you see here, <clears throat> not with all this garnish on it. And these were uh, uh, anti-gas impregnated. And oh, wow. oh, they were terrible. They could smell us probably from, uh, from uh, 100 yards away. <clears throat> and the equipment we carried was astronomical. <clears throat> My normal weight was 137. And uh, I weighed 276 when I left the airplane in air in the air, oh, wow. so uh, I was double that. So the actual <clears throat> bric-a-brac and war accoutrements that I carried was 176 pounds of stuff. Good thing you were an athlete. <clears throat> yeah, well, I always jumped number one. Did and, you really? Oh yeah, I like that number one. <laughs> so everything would be trusted. Even though you didn't know where you were jumping, no, you were number one. No, the number one. Wow. And okay, so, so you jump. And now you're behind enemy lines? Well, there's some things important okay. before that. Okay. There's a wild story okay. here about this. That, <coughs> that uh, <coughs> we were at uh, uh, the uh, marshalling area, uh, June 1 through June 5th, late June 5th. And uh, we were uh, uh, going to be uh, lectured by the uh, lieutenant, by the colonel. And he stood on the jeep, a hood of a jeep, and uh, with a uh, parachute, camouflage parachute draped over the hood, <clears throat> and uh, he's going to give us a speech. We called it the knife speech. Uh, he, was a, he was an aggressive character. You had to be, according to uh, uh, some of the other colonels, <clears throat> Colonel Sink and Colonel Nicholas of 506 and 502. <clears throat> he was the most outspoken Colonel, Colonel Johnson was. <clears throat> uh, he's going to give us a knife speech. And he always carried a Bowie knife with him. Oh. And that's a, I, don't know, I don't remember what it looked like, but it, it had a blade on it, maybe about 12 inches long and wide about three inches. And it had a four by uh, 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 eight foot piece of plywood with a, with a replica of Tojo on one side and Hitler on the other side. He'd stand at about 50 feet and throw that Bowie knife at it. Oh. And one time it bounced off the, off the uh, 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 board and it came back and hit him. And, oh, no. and so <clears throat> we were not allowed to fist fight. We're not allowed to unsheath a, a uh, knife and fight with a blade. If you want to fight, you fight with it, with it in the scabbard. Well, some of the guys uh, uh, challenged uh, Sergeant D. Huff, which was a platoon sergeant, or a, a squad leader. And they unsheathed their knife, and he got stabbed, and that was kept quiet. They, <clears throat> they sent him to the hospital, and he got sewed up quickly. <clears throat> wow. We didn't know about that one. So I was sent a number of different places and missed out on the diorama observation. So I didn't know where. The only thing I knew was a, uh, a lieutenant said, San Mare Iglesia, and that meant Holy Mother Church. Now, I don't know where San Mare Iglesia is. It's somewhere over there. 
so here we are at uh, the marshalling area, and uh, <clears throat> after the after the speech was given, we had dinner, we had ice cream, and we had steak and anything you wanted, <clears throat> and and uh, we were now sent to our aircraft with a lieutenant. We had uh, Lieutenant Jansen, who was the executive officer of Company C, was going to take our plane. There'd be 18 jumpers in a plane, a pilot, co-pilot, and a, uh, uh, a crew chief. And we had a real difficult time getting in there with all that equipment. And Because uh, and, uh, everybody had as much equipment oh, as you did. Oh, yeah. And some guys weighed in 180, and then with another 137 pounds, uh, they're afraid they're hitting the maximum. You know, parachute can't take too much. I don't know what the maximum is on a parachute, but it was probably a little scary for them, but they didn't know that. <clears throat> but at the plane, uh, on marching at, toward the plane, uh, one of the guys in my, in my squad, Marvin Van Buskirk, all of a sudden decided and felt his body was not making the uh, tingling noise that it should be. When we ran or walked fast, the uh, dog tags would clank and then make a noise. He was not clanking. And he took a shower before, like all of us did, and uh, he, he hung his dog tags on the curtain, the curtain of the shower and forgot his dog tags. Oh. So he announced that to me, and I said, okay, give us your equipment, Marvin. And we took all of his equipment, and I said, go back to the shower and find that darn thing. He went back and couldn't find it, so I said, get two strips of, uh, of uh, a canvas, and we'll write your name on it. So he, that's what his dog tags were. Or canvas. He had the best dog tag, probably of all. Or, or some of our equipment other than made a lot of noise. The the mess kit had knife, fork, and spoon in it. When you ran in that, those were loosely banging around inside. They could hear you coming, you know. So as far as the enemy was concerned, they knew we were coming, but they didn't know exactly. They knew pretty much when, but uh, not exactly where. <clears throat> 